everybody. It's so good to see everyone on this beautiful summer day. How many are glad to be in church today? Nice and loud. Yeah. All right. We are in a uh, series on the Sermon on the Mount. One second here. We're in a series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I got the TV right. There we go. And uh, we've been going through uh, chapter 5 to, to chapter 7 of Matthew. And Jesus is talking to a people, his, his disciples initially. And uh, about the most amazing sermon ever. I encourage you to go back and read chapter uh, Matthew um, 5, chapter 5 through chapter 7. We've been going through it week in, week out for months. We just completed the Lord's Prayer. And today, we're going back to the Sermon on the Mount, where we were, where Jesus talks about money and riches and power. How many of you like ants? Fire ants, yeah. Well, uh, in, our, in, our, in our house, in our area, we have, I don't know what it is, but we have thousands of ants outside. And so what I've done at times is I've actually put ant poison. I know I'm bad. Ant granulars out there and, and hoping the ants that will get it. Well, I heard a story of a guy did the same thing for fire ants, which can, you know, they can eat you. So, matter of fact, one of my missionary friends told me a story when he was a child. Uh, he got these fire ants on him, and his parents had to throw them in the bathtub because it was starting to, he was starting to bleed. They were all chewing at once. They all kind of climb together, and they start, and then they blow a trumpet, <laughs> and they all start chewing at the same time. So he said he got to get in the bathtub, and when he did that, the ants got in a little ball, and they were helping each other stay alive uh, by kind of going like this. He said it was dramatic. And so it's a big deal to try to kill those things, so they try to put these granulars around there. And uh, one time these ants were doing that. The fire ants were taking the granulars, which were really nice and juicy, going back to their nest, and then they noticed that there were other ants that were not fire ants that saw these granulars, and they went over, and they took it, and they began to go to their nest. Little did they realize they'd be killing themselves. Well, in many ways, that's what happens to us. Materialism, I want more. We see the things of this world. We, find we, we, we think it's wonderful. We see the earth chewing on it. I want to be like that. And we start putting these things in our own back. We take them back to our own homes. And the next thing you know, you find yourself beat down and why am I controlled? I'm, I got so much debt. I'm trying to be happy. And if we're not careful, wealth can begin to get a chokehold on us. And this is what begins to happen to many of our lives. And Jesus talks more about money than he does heaven or hell. He talks about money all the time. And I recognize that in a church, people don't like church. One of the big reasons is, ah, uh, they always talk about money. And maybe you grew up in a church where it was all about poverty. If you had money, you were an evil person. Surely you can't be serving God if you have money. Or you went to a church, unless you have money, you're not really blessed. And so we have these extremes. And people say, hey, give me $1,000. Call him right now for a $1,000 pledge. And God will bless you. You know, and he talks like that. And lo and behold, there's some woman in South Dakota that's on a foreclosure. And she gives her last $1,000 and take the medicine, her medicine for her diabetes. But she gives it to the evangelist. And the next thing, she's in a yacht. She's flying around the world. You're like, okay, I'll do the same. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's abuses like that, and that's not good. And it's unfortunate that the greatest lie has some truth in it. So people will take the lies of Scripture and utilize it for their own thing. Well, what does the Bible really say about riches and money? How can we not live in a poverty mentality or crazy? Well, first of all, how many of you like to play lottery? Okay. Caught you. I have news for you. How would you like to play lottery where you would be among the top 1% in the world? You'd be the richest in the world. Top 1%. You ever hear that old time? Oh, they're the top 1% of the world. How much you like that? Guess what? You all won the lottery by living in the United States and America. We're the wealthiest there is. We are. The fact that you have more than one, one set of clothes, you're, you're wealthy. You have something over your head. You have more, you can overeat, right? You even have air conditioners and heaters. And you even have the entire World Wide Web in your hands where you can go all around the world through this little device. My friends, we are the top 1% of the world. To much is given, much is required. And so we are all wealthy, but the thing is, we never feel we're wealthy. Studies have shown that if you make $50,000, you think, I'd be happy if I made $100,000. If you make $100,000, you think, you know what? I'd be happy if I made $150,000. If you make $150,000, I'll be happy if I made two fifty. dollars As a friend told me, Pastor, I don't know how anyone can live under $250,000 a year. I'm like, what? I can find a way. 
So, I mean, there's always these ways. If you make a million, then two million want more. If you make five, you want ten. It's never enough. There's always a desire to have more. And if you're not careful, a lot of people, for example, let's suppose you make um, $500 a week, and at the end of the week, you have $25 left. There are some people that make $10,000 a week, and at the end of the week, they have $50 left. And so we're all like in the same thing. We have so much debt. The average American has $18,000 in every credit card debt, every American. So we go on and on and on. A lot of people struggle with debt. And we find ourselves in a lot of stress right now, right? Especially if you're in retirement and you have a portfolio, you have a 401k, and now it's a 101k. I mean, <laughs> hello, what happened to that? And so you struggle with it. And there's a lot of anxiety about money. And if you're not careful, you can start feeling like all is about money and you work for money. You, you, it's just stressful when you're sending kids to college. It can be a little stressful. I don't know why, but why I would say such a thing. But anyhow, what I'd like to do right now is see what Jesus has to say about money and wealth. That's what he says. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in, your, light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So what's that all about? What is all, you can't serve God and money, so you've got to be poor then? Is that what's going on here? What's the Bible really say about riches and money? Well, today we're going to look at three things. How money can control us. People go, I know how that can control us. Some of you have a father and mother-in-laws that control you with money. Anyhow, that's beside the point. How money can control us. Why money controls us and the way to break free to real riches. You know, I heard a story of a, these three guys were friends. You had a preacher you had a banker, and you had a lawyer. And so uh, they had a friend of theirs that was going to die, and he gave each of them $30,000, three bags, $10,000 in each bag. He said, when I die, I want you to go to my casket, and I want you to drop $30,000, each of you, in the casket. So that's what they, uh, the, the funeral happened. All the guys looked at each other. They dropped three bags each. Well, the next week, they had breakfast together, and they were talking, and the pastor's having a hard time. He said, guys, I'm really sorry, but... I just thought it was really wasteful that, you know, we would throw money into a pit. And so I know he gave us $30,000. I, I, I put something else in that bag. I took the $10,000 because we had an orphanage that was going to close, and the kids would be out in the street. And so I, I just felt like I needed to do that. Really? How could you do that? Said the lawyer. And then all of a sudden the banker looks and says, hey, listen, I'm really sorry, but I'm part of the board of the hospital, and they need that new cancer wing. And if they didn't have that $20,000, they'd have to close the whole project and lose millions. And I, I just felt like, how could this possibly be? That, that, it's a little way. So I, I gave $20,000 uh, to the hospital, but I kept 10 and put it in the casket. Finally, the lawyer said, I can't believe you've done that, guys. You, a preacher, you who work in the banking industry with hospitals, I want to let you know I put the entire $30,000. I wrote a check and put it right on top of the casket. <laughs> well, we all find ways to get around, don't we? What about money? What does the Bible say about riches? How can money control us? Well, first of all, here's the first way it does, by blinding us to greed. I don't think we don't realize that we are blinded by greed. If you're blind, you don't know you're blind. You see, greed is different than any other sins. No one has ever come... I've been, I've been uh, in... I hate to say it, but vocational ministry, not professional, vocational ministry since 1997, no one has ever come up to me and said, Pastor, I need to talk to you about something that really is bothering me. What? I'm struggling with greed. I've never heard anyone say that to me. I've heard I'm struggling with, with adultery. I'm struggling with, uh, I'm struggling with stealing. I'm struggling. But no one has ever told me I'm struggling with a grateful heart. 
Yet, what does Jesus talk about here? Greed is different. This is why Jesus says it is an eye sin. It's an eye sin. Now, what does that mean, an eye sin? What's that all about? Well, Jesus, it didn't make much sense. He's talking about money, and then he talks about the eyes. What does the eyes have to do with money? Well, it has a lot to do with things with money. So what he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Ever hear of the eyes of the soul? Eyes are the windows of the soul. Look into my eyes. Okay? So what they believed in those days is the eye. Whatever was in your eye would shine the rest of you. Right now, we have lights going on here. We have windows. And so if I were to open those shades, light would come in. But if the shades are closed, you don't have the light coming in. And so basically you're all saying, whatever your eye is upon fills you. Whatever you look at fills you up. Whatever your eyes upon fills you. So if it's darkness, darkness comes upon you. If it's light, it's light. If it's greed, and that's really all it means. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He's talking about greed feeling our eyes where you can no longer see anymore. You're blinded and don't even realize it. You think you see, but you do not see at all. In the book of Proverbs, Jesus probably was alluding to some of the other scriptures. It says in Proverbs, a man with a, what? Evil eye. How many of you grew up Italian? You know what an evil eye is, right? He gave me the evil eye. You gave me the evil eye. You know, anyone's culture had the evil eye? No? Okay, your mother-in-law? Don't say that. Okay. <laughs> a man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come to him. What can happen is all you see is the money. All you see is wealth. All you see is I want to get that thing. And it becomes an evil eye, and it causes all kinds of trouble. As I mentioned, Jesus talks about money more than hell, more than heaven. Why? Because it's something that grabs us. Why? Because money gives us options. Money gives you the availability to control your life. The more money you have, the more options you have. And we like options, do we not? Absolutely. No question about it. See, in Revelation, here's Jesus again talking about the eyes. He didn't in the Sermon on the Mount. He says this, For you say, I am rich. I have prospered. I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Well, Jesus really knows how to make friends and influence people. Okay? You're pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. counsel you to buy from me gold refined by the fire so that you may be rich. Basically, what he was saying is this. It says in 1 Corinthians, whatever you do in this world for this world will burn away. Whatever you do for God in love will pass through the fire and you'll take it with you. And that's kind of the context here as well. So counsel that you buy from me gold refined by the fire. Make sure that your motives are correct. Make sure you're doing the right thing. You see, and I'll give you white garments that you may be clothed yourself, and shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and, and solve to anoint your eyes so that you may see that we're blind. Jesus needs to open our hearts. We don't realize. If you don't think you have trouble with greed, you're blind. All of us in this room struggle with greed. How could you say that? I just said it. It's very easy. We all struggle with greed. You're born with greed. Mine. We all want it our way. Greed is control. Greed is, I want to have all more. I want to have more of this. I want to have more of that. That's part of greed. We all struggle with it. If you don't think you struggle with greed, then you'll be deceived. If you know that greed is something you have to battle, it will help you to recognize it. And we're going to show you some ways to recognize greed and how to get rid of it. For example, materialism is an inordinate desire or dependence on money and material things. I have to have more. I know I had that. I have to have a bigger house. That house is not big enough. I need a bigger house. And think about it. We always want more. That's materialism. We're a materialism world. Entire economy is what? The consumer index. It's all about consuming. Are you a consumer? I hate to be called a consumer. I want to be called a producer, not a consumer. But we're constantly told that you're not going to be happy unless you get this new thing. Just the other day, I was watching an interview uh, from the 1950s of Mike Wallace, and he was saying, 
Uh, he's saying, Phillips cigarettes, are the, are the cigarettes doctors choose? <laughs> this is kind of funny. And the whole interview, he was talking about cigarettes. You know, and that's what we do. We always try to say, you want to be successful? Do this. It doesn't make a difference what it is. We see advertising. Materialism is an order of desire, to dependence on money and material things. Materialism has the power to blind you to materialism. It blinds you. You're not even aware of the fact that you have it. I mean, I... I had a friend of mine, his name is Harvey. When I was fresh out of college, I lived with him and his wife, Harvey and Angie. And uh, he told me that he came from Kansas. He says, we were so poor, we didn't know we were poor. He said, we had dirt floors and we had a well in the back. He said, we were happy until we drove to town. <laughs> then we realized, wait a minute here. I'm not happy. I want what he has. And all of a sudden, the misery index went up. Never forget my first mission trip when I went to Guatemala. I, closed, I, I climbed into the hills where the coffee fields were. It was delicious. Greatest coffee I ever had. I went into the top, this village in the top, and the people were running around with just no shoes on, the kids, not many clothes, and they're happy. They're having a great time. They're laughing. I wrote my diary. These people are not poor. They're rich. I'm the one that's poor. Look how happy they are. It's not things that make you happy. It's loving God and loving each other. And we want to encourage you with that. And so materialism, it, what it does, it, it, it constantly takes more and gives less. It's like being a drug addict. The more you have, the more you want. So materialism has the power to blind you. Jesus says this in, in Luke, a parallel passage. He, he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Beware. Why would Jesus say beware? Because it's easy to happen. Guard, look out for any type of greed. Life is not measured on how much you own. What happens when you, someone gives you too much change back? Well, do you give it back to the person? What happens if you see money on the floor? Do you, do you take it, put it in your pocket, or do you bring it forward? You know, all these things begin to happen of how you deal with situations. Now, how does money have power over us? Here's some like indications that will help a little, a little self-test. Here, here's the first one. It gives us significance. Think about it. If I drive in a nicer car, if I'm driving in a Maybach, or if I'm driving in a Bentley and I pull into the bar, ooh, look at that. Everyone's going to look at, whoa, who's that? That's Pastor Eric? What? How could he drive that? What color? He must be stealing from the church. <laughs> Little did I realize I was borrowing one of your cars. But, you know, you start to, you're like, how could he do that? And you've seen that. How about this, everybody, in social media? They're going, to, they're going to where? Hawaii? And you got to picture yourself on Kwasi Beach, and they're in Waikiki? How could he do that? That's not right. He's a pastor? How could he go to Waikiki? Okay? I saw a picture the other day of two hot dogs, look like knees, in front of a picture on an iPad, and it looked like someone was on vacation. You know, it's kind of funny. How money has power over us. It gives us significance. I'm important. How about this? You remember when you got the brand new shoes in third grade? Brand new shoes. What happened as soon as you got those brand new shoes? Someone invariably would step on them, wouldn't they? Because they're jealous of you, okay? It gives us significance. All of us want significance. I want to be seen as I have value. And money will help raise me up so I can drive around things, wear clothes. Wow, look at those clothes that person has. And I now have significance. I like it. Said, and we don't just look at other people who are below us economically and say, you're below me economically. We say, you're below me. Do we not? Oh, that part of, that part of town, all oh, those people. <laughs> They're so poor. They probably don't work. They're lazy. We look below, we, we, we kind of look at people based upon their class. Uh, those are undesirables. I really don't want to go to that place. Uh, come on, everybody. We struggle with it. Every, we, human beings struggle with that. How about we realize this? They make less than I make, but they have great value. I'm just saying, this is what can happen very, very easily. You see, how money has power over us, it gives us significance and it gives us security. Let's be honest, right? I got money saved and I'm feeling pretty good. And there, there's a book and Jesus tells a parable of a gentleman that was a farmer. He says to myself, I've done well for myself. I will build bigger barns and I will settle myself. What a wonderful life. No, he didn't say that. But that's what he said. 
And Jesus says, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. Then who will have all your wealth? He says, do not store up things on earth. They'll be a fool. It is so short. It's like building a sandcastle on the beach. As soon as you build it, some three-year-old is going to stamp on it. And then the tide will come in, right? So it gives us significance and it gives us security, right? We feel insecure. I need more money. What's going to happen? I got all these bills and I have to take the pills to deal with the bills. I got so much going on here. I need security. My 401 is now a 101. I'm supposed to retire. How come I'm supposed to handle the situation? I remember, forget, in 1986, they changed the tax law. You used to be able to shelter some of your income in real estate, and they changed it. People lost millions upon millions of dollars. People that I love and dearly really struggled during that time. So, I'm sure you've all heard this verse, right? Money is a root of all kinds of evils, right? So what we want to do is we're going to say people that are rich are bad. People that are poor are good. And we start this class warfare. That's what the Bible says, right? Money is the root of all kinds of evil. No, it's not. I changed scripture. You should stone me. For the what? Love of money. I love, who doesn't love money? Let's be honest. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, a root you don't see. Our roots underneath the surface, but it begins to pop up here, pop up there. You pull it out, it grows someplace else. I have an aversion to weeds. I drive the staff crazy. I, every time I'm out there pulling weeds, every, I can't stand weeds. And no matter how much I pull it, it still gets there. I have to find poison to kill it. And so, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. It's, it, you know, it's very difficult to have wealth. It is. The Bible says, Lord, don't give me too much wealth where I forget you, or too poor, well, I'll steal. Just give me enough to live on. I'll be okay. It's a great, it's a great test to have wealth. And so, well, if I had more money, I would do that. No, you won't. Well, let's, that's for a little bit later. This craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. In 1 Timothy 6.10, it says this, But as far as you, O man of God, flee these things. Flee what? Wanting to have. Free, flee, um, greed. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, steadfastness, and gentleness instead. Jesus says it very clear. He says this, No one can serve two masters. 50% of the population at the time of Jesus were slaves. 50%. And so if you had a slave, you had one slave. That's it. He said, you cannot have two masters. You either love the one and hate the other. That's what he says so clearly. We don't understand it within our context today. You cannot serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's either God or it's money. Wow, what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. What's the most important thing in my life? Is it money or is it God? Am I willing to walk away from it all? There was a man, his name is a rich young ruler. I don't know who he was, but he came to Jesus. He says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And he was a good-looking young man. He says, I've obeyed all the commandments. He was rich, and he was a young ruler. Every father that has a daughter wants their son I want their daughter, excuse me, to marry the rich, young ruler, right? I would love to meet this guy. Put him on the church board. Hallelujah. He's he's young. He's rich. He's single. I got a daughter. I want a retirement. Praise the Lord. Try to set it up. You want that, right? He came to Jesus. What must I do? Jesus looked at him with a lot of love. You lack one thing, he says. Go sell all that you have. And then come follow me. And the man walked away sad. Great were his riches. Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. Whoa, what's that supposed to mean? I don't have time to talk about it today, but it's difficult, everybody. And so we don't really know what was going on in a person's heart. You cannot serve God and money or mammon. I want more. I want more. We must be willing to serve God above it all. Serve God above it all. You see, 
I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said this, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he's finding his place in it while really it's finding its place in him. He starts growing. It's all about money. It's all about money. I gotta get more. I gotta get more. I have to get more. I'll be happy if I have more money. And the more money you have, the less happy you'll be. No, I like to try out that one, Lord, please. I just talked to someone recently who got a pretty large inheritance. He says, I thought I'd feel like I'm okay now. I don't. Now I'm more worried. The more you have, the more you worry, right? See, breaking the power of money is the first thing you have to understand is your treasure is the thing you feel makes everything worth it. That's your treasure. My, I, I got to get that resolution. I got to grow a big church and be known around the country. That's my treasure. I'm not saying it is, but I'm just saying it's a, as an act like that, right? Your treasure is the thing that you feel makes everything worth it. And it was us that made Jesus' death on the cross worth it. Do you realize that? He laid it all down for you and he laid it down, all down for me. How do you break the power of money? Here's one. You are breaking money's power over you if you no longer resent wealthy people. Ooh. Yeah. How's that one, everybody? Put that in your, no, don't put it in your pipe. We don't do that here. <laughs> what happens when someone gets that pay raise? What happens when someone graduates high school, summa cum laude, and you, you summa cum laude later for you, <laughs> and you got a full ride to Yale, right? Full ride to Yale. Parents are wealthy. Parents bought Yahoo stock and sold it before it lost its value. Bought Twitter stock before Elon Musk screwed it up. And they're wealthy. I mean, they're doing well. Beautiful wife, looks like a Barbie doll. I mean, drives a beautiful house. The kids are like ducks. They all, they all line up. They're really nice. They all wear nice clothes. And you're sitting there coming to church, and the kids are biting each other, spitting on each other. And here's this dude that has it all together. And then you find out that he was, he was, he was embezzling money. I knew it! <laughs> oh, what was going on? Nothing? All right? And let's make no mistake, social media, it does a wonderful job of doing that. Showing some, how could, how could he go there? I know what he makes. Right? Come on, everybody. Ah, I knew. Ah, uh, they got some plastic surgery. I can see what's going on. I and mean, we look at those little things. And we, meanwhile, the person took, took about 45 minutes with different type of lighting and Photoshop to look that way. So be careful. But we can begin to look at the other person, the resorts they're going to, the food they're eating, right? And you can begin to go and begin to feel jealous because you resent wealthy people. And make no mistake about it, it's such a, such like a, almost like a, 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 a just a primitive type of feeling that the political party system understands that. So let's make the rich evil. The rich are evil. They drive SUVs and they have smokestacks in their backyard, right? Or the poor are evil. They don't work. They, all they do is sit at home and collect. Meanwhile, we're doing all the work. And so we demonize both people and we begin to think we're better than those people because, you know, those people are, are, are wrong. Or a pastor can say, oh, that church down the street, it's big because they're not preaching the gospel. Or that, uh, we're small because we preach the gospel, or vice versa. We can play this comparison game. Comparison does nothing but make you miserable. So if you're breaking, money, if you're breaking money's power over you, you no longer resent wealthy people. Can you not resent wealthy people? Here's another one. You're breaking money's power over you if you respect poor people and don't look down on them. How about the person that washes your car? Or how about the person, you're in a hotel and the person can't even speak the language and they're working hard, but you go up and say, you know, thank you for all the work you're doing. And it's, I don't know, no English. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But you say, thank you. Gracias, right? How about we show respect to somebody? How about like you, you go to a party and here's a guy that can give you that pay raise, but there's a, there's a servant over here. And how about you go to that servant and, and say hi to that person instead? I'm just saying. God sees these things, everybody. He tests our hearts. He tests our hearts. So do you resent wealthy people? You probably have a problem with riches. Do you resent poor people? You probably have a problem with riches. You think your money defines you. No, it doesn't. Your character does. Your character does. You see, 
I like what Randy Alcorn said in his excellent book about wealth. He says, I'm convinced that the greatest deterrent to giving is this, the illusion that the earth is our home. This is not your home. Look at your neighbor and say, this is not your home. So give me your home. No, I'm just kidding. There we go. The Bible says this. Here's Jesus. We're going back to the very beginning here. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Treasures on earth where moth and rust. You see, back in those days, a set of clothes was very expensive. It, it, it would be almost like a five or $10,000 your outer garments would cost in today's money. A lot of money. Maybe it's $2,500. Maybe it's $10,000. Depends what kind you have. And so most people only had one outer garment. That had, then they had undergarments they would wear. And so you had two sets of clothes? Whoa. Some of you have storage units. In fact, I was just reading the other day, in America alone, there's enough storage units. That means people that have storage units outside their property. You know those things they built? There's enough storage units in the United States to put every woman and child in the United States in a storage unit. We have so much. So if you had one thing of clothing. But you know what happened? The moth would eat it. Have you ever noticed when you buy a nice piece of clothing, why do the moths go after that? You get a beautiful shirt and they eat it. Meanwhile, you have a thing from third grade and it's still... Anyhow. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Right? I like what Jim Elliot said. He is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let me say that again. He is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You see, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where rust and destroy, where thieves break it and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. You want to see what treasures in heaven is, looks like? Read uh, Hebrews chapter 11, where it talks about the great men and women that looked a far off place and made provisions ahead. Listen, I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it. You can't take it with you, except what you can send ahead is what you do for God in love. You do things for God in love. You treat people with love. So... You can store up treasures in heaven by doing those types of things. You see? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You want to know where your treasure is? Where is your treasure located? That's where your heart is. If it's all about money, that's where your heart is. That's why I have a discipline of giving first to the Lord. My treasure is God. Everything's about God. Let God's word be true and every man be a liar. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust all my life. I've tithed even when I couldn't tithe. I've always tithed. I've always given. I've always trusted God. I don't know how, but God somehow gave away. He got us through it. I wasn't always living perfect, but God always had, I always had enough food. As you can tell, I have extra storage. All right? I got plenty of food. God has always met my needs, not my greets. For where your treasure, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of your body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body would be full of light. We just talked about that, the whole thing of wealth. Okay, so how do we do it? Your treasure is the thing that makes everything worth it. Is it money? Is it a vacation house? Is it retirement? Is it getting that new job you want to get? Is it the car? Is it the fishing boat? Okay, are you breaking money's power over you by no longer resenting wealthy people, no longer and how about this? You're breaking the power of money over you by respecting the poor people and don't look down on them. Or you're breaking money's power over you if you become generous. I didn't receive it. I'll give it away. It's easy to spend someone else's money, isn't it? Guess what? It's not your money. It's the Lord's. Everything we have, we are only borrowing. You see? I like what Winston Churchill said. He said this, we make a living by what we get but we make a life on what we give. It is, it's more blessed to give than receive. And some of you have experienced that. We had to serve day and other times. When you give things to people and you look for nothing back, doesn't that feel good? Why does it feel good? Because you're made to do that. It's the way to do it. You see, if, oh, if your name is Gimme, Gimme, my name is Jimmy, no. You wanna, don't want to be a leech trying to suck the life out of everybody. You want to give to other people, not take. Look what Jesus says. Fear not as we head into a recession. 
as it costs $78 to fill my Subaru. It used to cost 40, but I'm not complaining. I'm very happy. Okay, fear, fear not, little flock. For your father's good pleasure is to give you the kingdom. God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us with true riches. Sell all your possessions and give to the needy. Now, are we supposed to do that right now? Well, obviously, take it in context, because the Bible says a, a righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. The Bible also says you're worse than an infidel if you don't take care of your own. So we're not talking about that. But Jesus said this, unless you hate your mother and father, unless you hate, unless you hate your wife or your own life, you're not worthy of me. Is he telling you to hate your mother and father? No. Is he telling you to hate your wife? No. Compared to him, it must be hate. In other words, there's no contest. It's God and everything. My friends, it's so much better when it's all about God. When it's all about God. You see, it says in the scriptures, provide yourselves, as Jesus speaking, with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. In 1 Timothy 6, 17, the apostle Paul talks to those rich people. Remember I told you in the very beginning, you all won the lottery. You're all rich. So what does that mean? Well, Teach those who are rich in this world, which is most Americans, not to be proud, not to trust in their money, because it can go away tomorrow, everybody, which is so unreliable. Can I hear, oh, no. Right? Their trust should be in what? God, who richly gives us all we, what? Need. For our in, what? God wants to have enjoyment? Absolutely. Absolutely. He knows what really makes us happy. He knows what really makes us happy. What makes us happy, you cannot lose, ultimately. Tell them to use their money to do good. So God gives you, listen, the Abrahamic covenant is this. I will bless you that you'll bless others. Are you blessing others what God has done to you? Now, we're going to celebrate 40 years here in September, and we were thinking as a church, man, what can we do? Uh, we, can, we can go to our banquet hall and spend $30,000 or something like that. We can do this. I'm like, I, I, don't, I just don't want to do that. And we're thinking to ourselves, what can we do? How about we plant four churches for our anniversary? And, you know, have pigs in a blanket instead. No, we don't have pigs in a blanket. I'm just kidding. How about we kind of scale back a little bit? We're going to thank God for what he's done. But how about we plant four churches instead and unreach people groups? So we're like, yeah, let's do that. So you'll hear more about that. So as we celebrate, we want to give back to God. I've seen God bless us as we pour out, as we give more away. God blesses us with more. And it feels so good to give away. You see, tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. I want to help you. How about you help me, right? By doing this, they'll be storing up for their treasures as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. God sees what you're doing. God will bless you when you trust him with this. You see, in Luke 16, 10, it says this. He who is faithful, it's Jesus speaking. He who is faithful with least is faithful also with much. And he who is unjust with his least is also unjust with must. Therefore, if you have not been faithful an unrighteous mammon, which is money, Unrighteous mammon, like the stuff we have here. Who will commit to you your trust, true riches? It's a test. Every time I get paid, it's a test. Seek first the kingdom of God. We'll talk about that next week. Stress buster. Trust God. It's not legalism. It's life. It's not legalism. It's life. Just trust God. I, I want to challenge you. Again, we're not going to check on you. I want to challenge you to trust God with your tithes and offerings. 10%, first thing that comes out of our check. I have no apologies about it. I dare you to try for six months. It doesn't work. We'll have the church write you a complete check back. And we believe that strongly that tithing works. It breaks the power of the enemy in your life. Why? Because it's always on you. When I, and that's, that's the beginning, everybody. That's the beginning of it. And then you, you know what? I'm going to bless this missionary. I'm going to do this. I'm going to help this person. And all of a sudden, you know what happens? You get blessed. Now, there's something very important I also need to share with you. You got to spend less than you make. So... We're going to be having a Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. We're going to make it affordable to everybody. Anyone that wants to take it will be a very small cost. 
And if you don't, can't afford it, we'll find a way. We want the whole church to be, uh, we're going to invest to help you to know better how to manage the money that you do have. Because God wants to bless us so we can bless others. The more you bless others, the more God will bless you. I'm telling you the truth. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust what is least, we unjust as much. Well, I'll start giving when I make more money. No, you won't. No, you won't. We had a friend of ours. Uh, he came and spoke here one time. His name is Jay Bergman. It was a Jewish man that my father spent six months with him, showing him the gospel uh, from the Old Testament. He says, I'll believe in Jesus if you can show me him in the Old Testament, but no New Testament. So my dad took six months and showed him. Do you believe yet? Nope. And finally, at the end, he says, I believe. Well, the man started getting involved with uh, investment firms and all that. And, he, and my dad said, well, first thing you need to do is tithe. He said, what? Tithe? What's that, 10%? I can't afford to do that right now. He says, if you can't afford to do it now, you'll never be able to afford it. Well, the man got involved in investments, became a, a millionaire, multi-millionaire, did very successful. And God blessed him. He walked away from it all and became a pastor. And took like a, a fraction of what he used to make and served God for 13, 14 years as a pastor. And he always says, I'm so thankful for your dad telling me that because I do not live with that burden. I give away. Everything is the Lord's, not just 10%. Everything is his. I want to tell you, everybody, that's how you do it. Be generous, spend less than you make. I mean, it's real simple. I can't help it. Yeah, can we really? Do we need to have all those channels? I'm telling you, do, do I really need to spend $60 a month at Starbucks? I mean, there's ways around it. It's so fun to find a way to give more away. You know, everybody, we're heading to some difficult times. I pray that our church is ready to reach out. That's why we have a food pantry. We want to help other people out. We want to make sure that anyone has need, we can help them. And, and can we do that? Can we be a generous people? I guarantee you, if we're generous and we give money to missions and help each other and help the communities around us, God's going to bless this church and going to bless you and I. Why? His word is true and we're not returned void. And the best riches of all is a clean heart and a clean conscience. I'm just telling you, everybody, it works. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you true riches? So I just want to remind you, everybody, the treasure is the thing that makes everything worth it. Is Jesus everything? Breaking money's power if you're no longer resent wealthy people or look down on people that have less money than you. You're breaking money's power over you when you become generous. It all comes from God. As my friend used to say, it's all going to burn anyhow. For this is how God loved the world. He sent an angel to die for you. No, he sent himself. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity today, Lord, to be reminded that you desire to bless us. You desire to pour out your riches upon us. And Father, you want to bless us so we could be a blessing to others. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name as we've, I've shared your word today and I've shared what you've said both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Lord, I pray that you would set us free today. All of us struggle with greed in one, in one level or another. Father, I pray for those who aren't tithing. They would, they would put you to the test, as you say in Scripture in Malachi. Father, for those that are stingy, they would begin to give. Father, I also pray for self-discipline to be able to put away some things we're spending money on that we really don't need to spend money on. Lord, I pray that you would make this church a church that is good stewards of their money. Father, that we'd be able to bless more people in these difficult times we're heading in Jesus' name. Father, we pray you break the power of this on our, upon our lives in Jesus' name.